Dramatis Personae, and Act One of Sir Thomas More by Anthony Munday. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dramatis Personae. Doll Williamson, Roper's Wife, read by Ariel Lipshaw. Francis de Balda, Harry, Erasmus, Inclination, Hangman, read by David Nicholl. Cavalier, read by Steve Weir. Williamson, Lady Moore, read by Elizabeth Clatt. Sherwin, read by G. M. Perswara. George Betts, Vice, Bishop of Rochester, Goff, read by Tricia G. John Lincoln, read by Brett Hirsch. The Lord Mayor, read by Ron Altman. Sir Thomas More, read by Larry Wilson. Sjorsby, read by Nigel Carrington. Lifter, Wit, read by Alan Mapstone. Recorder, Robin, Officer, read by Francis Brown. Another, Kit, Randall, Unmanned Servant. Read by Lambda. The Earl of Shrewsbury. Luggins. Porter. Read by Todd. The Earl of Surrey. Read by M.B. Sir Thomas Palmer. Read by Greg Giordano. Sir Roger Songwee. Gentleman Porter. Played by Granary Bryan. Messenger. Lady Mayoress. Read by Michelle Eaton. Clown. Read by Ellie Cat. Sir John Monday, read by Russell Hughes. Sergeant, Sheriff, Shreve, First Warder, read by Christine G. Crofts, Morris, Player, read by K. Hand. Faulkner, Second Warder of the Tower, read by Rapunzelina. Roper, read by Arnaldo Machado. The Prologue, read by Vin Lucid. Vanity, read by Eden Ray Hedrick. Clerk of the Council, Brewer, read by Elise Boucher. Daughter, read by Charlotte Duckett. Catesby, Second Sheriff, by Mary Kay. Downs, read by Jake Friedman. Third Water, read by Braze. Poor Woman, by Ethel Boss. Lieutenant, read by Victoria. The Butler, read by Mary J. Horsekeeper, read by Anna Simon. Narrated by David Lawrence. Act One. Scene One. London. A street. Enter at one end John Lincoln, with the two Betses together. At the other end enters Francis de Bard, and Doll, a lusty woman, he hailing her by the arm. Whither wilt thou hail me? Whither I please. Thou art my prize, and I plead purchase of thee. Purchase of me? Away, ye rascal! I am an honest, plain carpenter's wife, and though I have no beauty to like a husband, yet whatsoever is mine scorns to stoop to a stranger. Hand off, then, when I bid thee. Go with me quietly, or I'll compel thee. Compel me, ye dog's face! Thou thinkst thou hast the goldsmith's wife in hand, whom thou enticest from her husband with all his plate, and when thou turnst her home to him again, madest him, like an ass, pay for his wife's board. So will I make it thy husband, too, if it please me. Enter Cavalier with a pair of doves, Williamson the carpenter, and Sherwin following him. Here he comes himself. Tell him so, if thou darest. Follow me no further. I say thou shalt not have them. I bought them in Cheapside, and paid my money for them. He did, sir, indeed, and you offer him wrong, both to take them from him, and not restore him his money neither. If he paid for them, let it suffice that I possess them. Beefs and brews may serve such hinds. Are pigeons meat for a coarse carpenter? It is hard when Englishmen's patience must be thus jetted on by strangers. And they not dare to revenge their own wrongs. Lincoln, let's beat them down and bear no more of these abuses. We may not, Betts. Be patient and hear more. How now, husband? What, one stranger take thy food from thee and another thy wife? By our lady, 
Flesh and blood, I think, can hardly brook that. Will this gear never be otherwise? Must these wrongs be thus endured? Let us step in and help to revenge their injury. What art thou that talkest of revenge? My lord ambassador shall once more make your mare have a check, if he punish thee for his saucy presumption. Indeed, my lord mayor, on the ambassador's complaint, sent me to Newgate one day, because against my will I took the wall of a stranger. You may do anything. The goldsmith's wife and mine now must be at your commandment. The more patient fools are ye both to suffer it. Suffer it? Mend it thou or e, if ye can or dare. I tell thee, fellows, and she were the mayor of London's wife, and I are once in my possession. I would keep her in spite of him that dare say nay. I tell thee, Lombard, these words should cost thy best cape, were I not curbed by duty and obedience. The mayor of London's wife, O oh God, shall it be thus? Why, Bets, am I not as dear to my husband as my lord mayor's wife to him? And wilt thou so neglectly suffer thine own shame? Hands off, proud stranger! Or, by him that bought me, if men's milky hearts dare not strike a stranger, yet women beat them down ere they bear these abuses. Mistress, I say you shall along with me. Touch not, Doll Williamson, lest she lay thee along on God's dear earth. And you, sir, to cavalier, that allow such coarse cates to carpenters, whilst pigeons, which they pay for, must serve your dainty appetite, deliver them back to my husband again, or all call so many women to mine assistance, as will not leave one inch untorn of thee. If our husbands must be bridled by law, and forced to bear your wrongs, their wives will be a little lawless, and soundly beat ye. Come away, de bard, and let us go complain to my lord ambassador. Exeunt, Embo. Ay, go and send him among us, and we'll give him his welcome too. I am ashamed that free-born Englishmen, having beaten strangers within their own homes, should thus be braved and abused by them at home. It is not our lack of courage in the cause, but the strict obedience that we are bound to. I am the goldsmith whose wrongs you talked of. But how to redress yours or mine own is a matter beyond our abilities. Not so, not so, my good friends. I, though a mean man, a broker by profession, and named John Lincoln, have long time winked at all these wild enormities with mighty impatience. And as these two brethren here, Betts by name, can witness, with loss of mine own life would gladly remedy them. And he is in a good forwardness, I tell ye, if I'll hit right. As how, I prithee, tell it to Doll Williamson. You know the spittle sermons begin the next week. I have drawn a bill of our wrongs and the stranger's insolences. Which he means the preachers shall there openly publish in the pulpit. Oh, but that they would. If faith, it would tickle our strangers thoroughly. Ay, and if you men durst not undertake it, before God we women would. Take an honest woman from her husband, why it is intolerable. But how find ye the preachers affected to our proceeding? Master Dr. Standish hath answered that it becomes not him to move any such thing in his sermon, and tells us we must move the mayor and aldermen to reform it, and doubts not but happy success will ensue on statement of our wrongs. You shall perceive there's no hurt in the bill. Here's a couple of it. I pray ye, hear it. With all our hearts, for God's sake, read it. Reads. To you all, the worshipful lords and masters of this city, that will take compassion over the poor people your neighbors, and also the great importable hurts, losses, and hindrances, whereof proceedeth extreme poverty, to all the king's subjects that inhabit within this city and suburbs of the same. For so it is that aliens and strangers eat the bread from the fatherless children, and take the living from all the artificers, and the intercourse from all the merchants, whereby poverty is so much increased, that every man bewaileth the misery of other, for craftsmen be brought to beggary, and merchants to neediness. Wherefore, the premises considered, the redress must be of the common knit and united to one part. And as the hurt and damage grieveth all men, so must all men see to their willing power for remedy, and not suffer the said aliens in their wealth, and the natural-born men of this region, to come to confusion. 
before god tis excellent and i'll maintain the suit to be honest well say tis red what is your further meaning in the matter what mary list to me no doubt but this will store us with friends enow whose names we will closely keep in writing and on may day next in the morning will go forth a maying but make it the worst may day for the strangers that ever they saw how say ye do ye subscribe or are ye faint-hearted revolters hold thee george bates there's my hand in my heart by the lord i'll make a captain among ye and do somewhat to be talk of for ever after my masters ere we part let's friendly go and drink together and swear true secrecy upon our lives there spake an angel come let us along then exeunt scene two london the sessions house an heiress is drawn and behind it as in sessions sit the lord mayor justice sherby and other justices sheriff moore and the other sheriff sitting by smart is the plaintiff lifter the prisoner at the bar recorder officers having dispatched our weightier businesses we may give ear to petty felonies master sheriff moore what is this fellow my lord he stands indicted for a purse he hath been tried the jury is together who sent him in that did i my lord had he had right he had been hanged ere this the only captain of the cut purse crew what is his name as his profession is lifter my lord one that can lift a purse right cunningly and is that he accuses him the same my lord whom by your honour's leave i must say somewhat too because i find in some respects he is well worthy blame good master justice shoresby speak your mind we are well pleased to give you audience hear me smart thou art a foolish fellow if lifter be convicted by the law as i see not how the jury can acquit him i'll stand to it thou art guilty of his death my lord that's worthy the hearing listen then good master moore i tell thee plain it is a shame for thee with such a sum to tempt necessity no less than ten pounds sir will serve your turn to carry in your purse about with ye to crake and brag in taverns of your money i promise ye a man that goes abroad with an intent of truth meeting such a booty may be provoked to that he never meant what makes so many pilferers and felons but such fond baits that foolish people lay to tempt the needy miserable wretch ten pounds odd money this is a pretty sum to bear about which were more safe at home for god twere well to find years much more lord mayor and more whisper to the relief of the poor prisoners to teach ye be more careful of your own in sooth i say ye were but rightly served if ye had lost as much as twice ten pounds good my lord sooth a point or two for once only to try conclusions in this case content good master moore we'll rise a while and till the jury can return their verdict walk in the garden how say ye justices we like it well my lord we'll follow ye exeunt lord mayor and justices nay plaintiff go you too and officers exeunt smart stand you aside and leave the prisoner to me a while lifter come hither what is your worship's pleasure Sir, you know that you are known to me, and I have often saved ye from this place since first I came in office. Thou seest beside that Justice Sursby is thy heavy friend, by all the blame that he pretends to smart, for tempting thee with such a sum of money. I tell thee what, devise me but a means to pick or cut his purse, and on my credit, and as I am a Christian and a man, I will procure thy pardon for that jest. Good Master Shreve, seat not my overthrow. You know, sir, I have many heavy friends, and more indictments like to come upon me. 
you are too deep for me to deal with all you are known to be one of the wisest men that is in england i pray ye master sheriff go not about to undermine my life lifter i am true subject to my king thou much mistake me and for thou shalt not think i mean by this to hurt thy life at all i will maintain the act when thou hast done it thou knowest there are such matters in my hands as if i please to give them to the jury i should not need this way to circumvent thee all that i aim at is a merry jest perform it lifter and expect my best i thank your worship god preserve your life but master justice shoresby is gone in i know not how to come near where he is let me alone for that i'll be thy setter i'll send him hither to thee presently under the colour of thine own request of private matters to acquaint him with if ye do so sir then let me alone forty to one but then his purse is gone well said but see that thou diminish not one penny of the money but give it me it is the cunning act that credits thee i will good master sheriff i assure ye exeunt more i see the purpose of this gentleman is but to check the folly of the justice for blaming others in a desperate case wherein himself may fall as soon as any to save my life it is a good adventure silence there ho now doth the justice enter enter justice sherby now sirrah now what is your will with me wilt thou discharge thy conscience like an honest man what sayest to me sirrah be brief be brief as brief sir as i can aside if ye stand fair i'll be brief anon speak out and mumble not what sayest thou sirrah sir i am charged as god is my comfort with more than's true sir sir ye are indeed with more than's true for you are flatly charged with felony you're charged with more than truth and that is theft more than a true man should be charged with all thou art a varlet that's no more than true trifle not with me do not do not sirrah confess but what thou knowest i ask no more there be sir there be if it please your worship there be varlet what be there tell me what there be come off or on there be what be there knave there be sir divers cunning fellows that while you stand and look em in the face will have your purse thou art an honest knave tell me what are they where they may be caught ay those are they i look for you talk of me sir alas i am puny there's one indeed goes by my name he puts down for all purses he'll steal your worship's purse under your nose ha <laughs> ha art thou so sure varlet well well be as familiar as thou wilt my knave tis this i long to know and you shall have your longing ere ye go this fellow sir perhaps will meet ye thus or thus or thus and in kind compliment pretend acquaintance somewhat doubtfully and these embraces serve ay marry lifter wherefore serve they shrugging gladly only to feel whether you go under sail or no or that your lading be aboard your bark in plainer english lifter if my purse be stored or no ye have it sir excellent excellent then sir you cannot but for the manner's sake walk on with him for he will walk your way alleging either you have much forgot him or he mistakes you but in this time has he my purse or no not yet sir fie aside no nor i have not yours enter lord mayor and company but now we must forbear my lord's return a marron on it lift a will more anon ay thou sayest true there are shrewd knaves indeed he sits down but let me gull them widgeon me rook me fop me i faith i faith they are too short for me knaves and fools meet when purses go wise men look to their purses well or no more aside lifter is it done lifter aside done master shreve and there it is aside then build upon my word i'll save thy life lifter stand to the ball the jury have returned the guilty thou must die according to the custom look to it master shrove then gentlemen as you are wont to do 
because as yet we have no burial place, what charity your meaning is to bestow toward burial of the prisoners now condemned, let it be given. There is first for me. And there for me. And me. Body of me. My purse is gone. Gone, sir? What here? How can that be? Against all reason, sitting on the bench. Lifter, I talked with you. You have not lifted me, huh? Suspect ye me, sir. Oh, what world this is. But hear ye, Master Sursby. Are ye sure ye had a purse about ye? Sure, Master Shreve, as sure as you are there. And in it seven pounds odd money on my faith. Seven pounds odd money. What, were you so mad being a wise man and a magistrate to trust your purse with such a liberal sum? Seven pounds odd money. For God, it is a shame with such a sum to tempt necessity. I promise ye, a man that goes abroad with an intent of truth, meeting such a booty may be wrought to that he never thought. What makes so many pilferers and felons but these fond baits that foolish people lay to tempt the needy miserable wretch? Should he be taken now that has your purse, I stand to it you are guilty of his death. For questionless, he would be cast by law. Twere a good deed to find ye as much more to the relief of the poor prisoners, to teach ye lock your money up at home. Well, Master Moore, you are a merry man. I find ye, sir, I find ye well enough. Nay, ye shall see, sir, trusting thus your money, and lift her here in for trial for like case, but that the poor man is a prisoner, it would be now suspected that he had it. Thus may ye see what mischief often comes by the fond carriage of such needless sums. Believe me, Master Shoresby, this is strange. You, being a man so settled in assurance, will fall in that which you condemned in other. Well, Master Sursby, there's your purse again, and all your money. Fear nothing of more. Wisdom still keeps the mean and locks the door. Scene three, London, a state apartment. Enter the Earls of Shrewsbury and Surrey, Sir Thomas Palmer and Sir Roger Chomley. My Lord of Surrey and Sir Thomas Palmer, might I with patience tempt your grave advice? I tell you true that in these dangerous times I do not like this frowning vulgar brow. My searching eye did never entertain a more distracted countenance of grief than I have late observed in the displeased commons of the city. Tis strange that from his princely clemency, so well a tempered mercy and a grace to all the aliens in this fruitful land, that this high crested insolence should spring from them that breathe from his majestic bounty, that, fattened with the traffic of our country, already leaps into his subject's face. Yet Sherwin, hindered to commence his suit, against Debard by the ambassador, by supplication made unto the king, who having first enticed away his wife, and got his plate, near worth four hundred pound, to grieve some wronged citizens that found this vile disgrace oft cast into their teeth, of late sues Sherwin and arrested him, for money for the boarding of his wife. The more knave bar that using Sherwin's goods doth ask him interest for the occupation. I like not that, my lord of Shrewsbury. He's ill-bested that lends a well-paced horse unto a man that will not find him meet. My lord of Sully will be present still. Ay, being then employed by your honours, to stay the broil that fell about the same whereby persuasion I enforce the wrongs, and urge the grief of the displeased city. He answered me, and with a solemn oath, that, if he had the mayor of London's wife, he would keep her in despite of any English. "'Tis good, Sir Thomas, then, for you and me. Your wife is dead, and I a bachelor. If no man can possess his wife alone, I am glad, Sir Thomas Palmer, I have none. If I take a wife, I shall find a mate. And reason good, Sir Roger Chumley, too. 
if these hot frenchmen needsly will have sport they should in kindness yet defray the charge tis hard when men possess our wives in quiet and yet leave us in to discharge their diet my lord acatours shall not use the market for our provisions but some stranger now will take the victuals from him he hath brought a carpenter as i was late informed who having bought a pair of doves in cheap immediately a frenchman took them from him and beat the poor man for resisting him and when this fellow did complain his wrongs he was severely punished for his labour but if the english blood be once put up as i perceive their hearts already full i fear me much before their spleens be cold some of these saucy aliens for their pride will pay for it soundly wheresoe'er it lights this tide of rage that with the eddy strives i fear me much will drown too many lives now i thought god your honours pardon me men of your praise and goodness are to blame i tell you true my lords that in that his majesty is not in fault of this base abuse and that he wrongs the other to his subjects for if he were i know his gracious wisdom would soon redress it enter a messenger sirrah what news none good i fear my lord ill news and worse i fear will follow if speedily it be not looked unto the city is in an uproar and the mayor is threatened if he come out of his house a number poor artificers are up in arms and threaten to avenge their wrongs we feared what this would come unto this first of the doctors publishing the bill of wrongs in public of the spittle that dr beale may chance beshrew himself for reading of the bill let us go gather forces to the mayor for quick suppressing this rebellious rout now i bethink myself of master moore one of the sheriffs a wise and learned gentleman and in especial favour with the people he backed with other grave and sober men may by his gentle and persuasive speech perhaps prevail more than we can with power believe me but your honour well advises let us make haste for i do greatly fear some of their graves this morning's work will bear Exeunt. End of Act One of Sir Thomas More by Anthony Munday. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Two, Scene One Cheapside. Enter three or four apprentices of trades, with a pair of cudgels. Come, lay down the cudgels. Oh, Robin, you met as well at Bonner Hill to have you with us a maying this morning. Faith, Harry, the head drawer to the mitre by the red conduit called me up, and we went to breakfast in the St. Anne Lane. But come, who begins? In good faith, I am clean out of practice. When wast at Garrett's school, Harry? Not this great while. Never since I break his usher's head when he played his scholar's prize at the Star in Bread Street. I use all to George Philpott's at Dowgate. He's the best back swords man in England. Bait me an ace of that, quoth Walton. I'll not bait your pin on, sir, for by this cudgel tis true. I will cudgel that opinion out of ye. Did you break an usher's head, sir? I marry I did, sir. I am very glad on it. You shall break mine too, and ye can. Sir, a privy, what art thou? why i am apprentice as thou art seest thou now i'll play with thee at blunt here in cheapside and when thou hast done if thou beest angry i'll fight with thee at sharp in moorfields i have a sword to serve my turn in a favour come jolly to serve scene two sir martin legrand enter lincoln to betzes Williamson, Sherwin, and other, armed. Doll in a shirt of mail, a headpiece, sword, and buckler. A crew attending. Come, come, we'll tickle their turnips, we'll butter their boxes. Shall strangers rule the roost? Yes, but we'll baste the roost. Come, come, a flaunt, a flaunt. Brother, give place, and hear John Lincoln speak. I, Lincoln, my leader, and Doll, my true breeder, 
with the rest of our crew shall ran tan terra ran do all they what they can shall we be bobbed braved no shall we be held under no we are free-born and do take scorn to be used so peace there i say ere captain lincoln speak keep silence till we know his mind at large then largely deliver speak bully and he that presumes to interrupt thee in thy oration this for him then gallant bloods you whose free souls do scorn to bear the enforced wrongs of aliens add rage to resolution fire the houses of these audacious strangers this is st martin's and yonder dwells Mutus, a wealthy picardy at the green gate de bardet peter van holk adrian martin with many more outlandish fugitives shall these enjoy more privilege than we in our own country let's then become their slaves since justice keeps them not in greater awe we be ourselves rough ministers of law use no more swords no more words but fire the houses brave captain courageous fire me their houses ay for we may as well make bonfires on may day as at midsummer we'll alter the day in the calendar and set it down in flaming letters stay no that would much endanger the whole city whereto i would not the least prejudice no nor i neither so may my own house be burned for company i tell you what we'll drag the strangers into more fields and there bombast them till they stink again and that's soon done for they smell for fear already let some of us enter the strangers houses and if we find them there then bring them forth but if ye bring them forth ere ye find them i'll ne'er allow of that now mars for thy honour dutch or french so it be a wench all upon her exeunt some and sherwin now lads sure shall we labour in our safety i hear the mayor hath gathered men in arms and that shreve moore an hour ago rised some of the privy council in at ludgate force now must make our peace or else we fall twill soon be known we are the principal and what of that if thou beest afraid osbend go home again and hide thy head for by the lord i'll have a little sport now we are at it let's stand upon our swords and if they come receive them as they were our enemies enter sherwin and the rest a purchase a purchase we have found we have found what nothing not a french fleming nor a fleming french to be found but all fled in plain english how now have you found any no not one they're all fled then fire the houses that the mayor being busy about the quenching of them we may escape burn down their kennels let us straight away least this day prove to us an ill may day fire fire i'll be the first if hanging come tis welcome that's the worst exeunt scene three the guild hall enter at one door sir thomas moore and lord mayor at another door sir john munday hurt what sir john munday are you hurt a little knock my lord there was even now a sort of prentices playing at cudgels i did command them to their masters houses but now i fear me they are gone to join with lincoln sherwin and their dangerous train the captains of this insurrection have taken themselves to arms and came but now to both the counters where they have released sundry indebted prisoners and from thence i hear that they are gone into st martin's where they intend to offer violence to the amazed lombards therefore my lord if we expect the safety of the city tis time that force or parley do encounter with these displeased men enter a messenger how now what news my lord the rebels have broke open newgate from whence they have delivered many prisoners both felons and notorious murderers that desperately cleave to their lawless train up with the drawbridge gather some forces to cornhill and cheapside and gentlemen if diligence be weighed on every side a quiet ebb will follow this rough tide enter shrewsbury surrey palmer and chomley lord mayor his majesty receiving notice of this most dangerous insurrection hath sent my lord of surrey and myself sir thomas palmer and our followers to add unto your forces our best means for pacifying of this mutiny in god's name then set on with happy speed the king lament if one true subject bleed 
I hear they mean to fire the Lombards' houses. O oh, power, what thou art in a madman's eyes! Thou makest the plodding idiot bloody wise. My lords, I doubt not but we shall appease with a calm breath this flux of discontent to call them to parley questionless. May fall out good, tis well said, Master Moore. Let's to thee, simple men, for many sweat under this act that knows not the law's debt which hangs upon their lives. For silly men plod on they know not how, like a fool's pen that ending shows not any sentence writ, linked but to common reason or slightest wit. These follow for no harm, but yet incur self-penalty with those that raise this stir. A God's name on, to calm our private foes with breath of gravity, not dangerous blows. Scene 4. St. Martin's Gate. Enter Lincoln, Dahl, Clown, George Betts, Williamson, others, and a sergeant-at-arms. Peace, hear me. He that will not see a red herring at a hairy groat, butter at eleven pence a pound, meal at nine shillings a bushel, and beef at four nobles a stone, this to me. It will come to that pass if strangers be suffered. Mark him. Our country is a great eating country. Ergo, they eat more in our country than they do in their own. By a halfpenny loaf a day Troy wait. They bring in strange roots, which is merely to the undoing of poor prentices. For what's a sorry parsnip to a good heart? Trash, trash! They breed sore eyes, and tis enough to infect the city with the palsy. Nay, it has infected it with the palsy. For these bastards of dung, as you know they grow in dung, have infected us, and it is our infection will make the city shake, which partly comes through the eating of parsnips. True, and pumpkins together. What say ye to the mercy of the king? Do ye refuse it? You would have us upon this, would you? No, Mary, do we not. We accept of the king's mercy, but we will show no mercy upon the strangers. You are the simplest thing that ever stood in such a question. How say you now, prentices? Prentice is simple. Down with him. Prentice, Prentice is simple. Prentice, Prentice is simple. simple. Enter the Lord Mayor, Surrey, Shrewsbury, Moore. Hold, in the King's name, hold. Friends, masters, countrymen. Peace, how peace. I charge you, keep the peace. My masters, countrymen. The noble Earl of Shrewsbury, let's hear him. We'll hear the Earl of Surrey. The Earl of Shrewsbury. We'll hear both. Both, 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 both. Peace, I say, peace. Are you men of wisdom? Or what are you? What you will have them, but not men of wisdom. Will not hear my lord of Surrey. No, 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 no. no. Shrewsbury, Shrewsbury. Whilst they are o'er the bank of their obedience, thus will they bear down all things. Sheriff Moore speaks. Shall we hear Sheriff Moore speak? Let's hear him. I keeps a plenty shrivelry, and I mean my brother Arthur Watchin's serious safe yeoman. Let's hear Shreve Moore. Shreve Moore, 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 Shreve Moore. Even by the rule you have among yourselves, command still silence. Sorry, sorry, Moore, Moore. Peace, peace, silence, peace. Peace, peace, silence, peace. You that have voice and credit with the number, Command them to stillness. A plague on them. They will not hold their peace. The duel cannot rule them. Then what a rough and righteous charge have you to lead those that duel cannot rule? Good masters, hear me speak. Ay, by the mass will we more. Thou art a good housekeeper, and I thank thy good worship for my brother Arthur Watchins. Peace, peace. peace. Look what you do offend, you cry upon that is the peace not one of you here present had there such fellows lived when you were babes that could have topped the peace as now you would the peace wherein you have till now grown up had been taken from you and the bloody times could not have brought you to the state of men alas poor things what is it you have got although we grant you get the thing you seek 
Mary, the removing of the strangers, which cannot choose but much advantage the poor handicrafts of the city. Grant them removed, and grant that this your noise hath chid down all the majesty of England. Imagine that you see the wretched strangers, their babes at their backs and their poor luggage, plodding to the ports and coasts for transportation, and that you sit as kings in your desires, authority quite silent by your brawl, and you in rough of your opinion clothed. What had you got? I tell you, you had taught how insolence and strong hand should prevail, how order should be quelled, and by this pattern not one of you should live an aged man. For other ruffians, as their fancies wrought, with self-same hand, self-reasons, and self-right would shark on you, and men like ravenous fishes would feed on one another. Before God, that's as true as the gospel. Nay, this is a sound fellow, I tell you. Let's mark him. Let me set up before your thoughts, good friends, on supposition, which, if you will mark, you shall perceive how horrible a shape your innovation bears. First, tis a sin which oft the apostles did forewarn us of, urging obedience to authority. And twere no error if I told you all, you were in arms against your God himself. Mary, God, God forbid, forbid that. that. Nay, certainly you are. For to the king God hath his office lent of dread, of justice, power, and command, hath bid him rule, and willed you to obey. And to add ampler majesty to this, he hath not only lent the king his figure, his throne, and sword, but given him his own name, calls him a god on earth. What do you then, rising against him that God himself installs, but rise against God? And what do you to your souls in doing this? Oh, desperate as you are, wash your foul minds with tears, and those same hands that, like rebels, lift against the peace, lift up for peace, and your unreverent knees, make them your feet to kneel to be forgiven. Tell me but this. What rebel captain, as mutinies are incident by his name, can still the rout? Who will obey a traitor? Or how can well the proclamation sound when there is no addition but a rebel to qualify a rebel? You'll put down strangers, kill them, cut their throats, possess their houses, and lead the majesty of law in line to slip him like a hound. Say now the king, as he is clement if the offender mourn, should so much come to short of your great trespass as but to banish you, whither would you go? What country, by the nature of your error, should give you harbor? Go you to France or Flanders, to any German province, to Spain or Portugal, nay, anywhere that not adheres to England. Why, you must needs be strangers. Would you be pleased to find a nation of such barbarous temper that breaking out in hideous violence would not afford you an abode on earth, wet their detested knives against your throats, spurn you like dogs, and like as if that God owed not nor made not you, nor that the claimants were not all appropriate to your comforts, but chartered unto them, what would you think to be thus used? This is the stranger's case, and this your mountainish inhumanity. Faith tells us true. Let's do as we may be done by. We'll be ruled by you, Master Moore, if you'll stand our friend to procure our pardon. Submit you to these noble gentlemen, entreat their mediation to the king, give up yourself to form, obey the magistrate, and there's no doubt but mercy may be found if you so seek. To persist in it is present death, but if you yield yourselves, no doubt what punishment you in simplicity have incurred, his highness in mercy will most 
graciously pardon we yield and desire his highness's mercy they lay by their weapons no doubt his majesty will grant it you but you must yield to go to several prisons till that his highness will be further known most willingly whether you will have us lord mayor let them be sent to several prisons and there in any case be well entreated my lord of surrey please you to take horse and ride to cheapside where the aldermen are with their several companies in arms will them to go unto their several wards both for the stay of further mutiny and for the apprehending of such persons as shall contend i go my noble lord exit surrey we'll straight go tell his highness these good news withal shrieve more i'll tell him how your breath hath ransomed many a subject from sad death exit shrewsbury and cholmley lincoln and sherwin you shall both to newgate the rest unto the counters go guard them hence a little breath well spent cheats expectation in his fairest event well sheriff moore thou hast done more with thy good words than all they could with their weapons give me thy hand keep thy promise now for the king's pardon or by the lord i'll call thee a plain coney catcher farewell treat moore and as we yield by thee so make our peace then thou dealst honestly ay and save us from the gallows else the devils double honestly they are led away master shrieve moore you have preserved the city from a most dangerous fierce commotion for if this limb of riot here in st martin's had joined with other branches of the city that did begin to kindle twould have bred great rage that rage much murder would have fed not steel but eloquence hath wrought this good you have redeemed us from much threatened blood my lord and brethren what i here have spoke my country's love and next the city's care enjoined to me which since it thus prevails think god hath made weak more his instrument to thwart sedition's violent intent i think twere best my lord some two hours hence we meet at the guild hall and there determine that through every ward the watch be clad in armor but especially proud that at the city's gates selected men substantial citizens do ward to-night for fear of further mischief it shall be so but yond methinks my lord of shrewsbury enter shrewsbury my lord his majesty sends loving thanks to you your brethren and your faithful subjects your careful citizens but master moore to you a rougher yet as kind salutation a knight's creation is this knightly steel rise up sir thomas moore i thank his highness for thus honouring me this is but first taste of his princely favour for it hath pleased his high majesty noting your wisdom and deserving merit to put this staff of honour in your hand for he hath chose you of his privy council my lord for to deny my sovereign's bounty were to drop precious stones into the heaps whence they first came to urge my imperfections in excuse were all as stale as custom no my lord my service is my king's good reason why since life or death hangs on our sovereign's eye his majesty hath honoured much the city in this his princely choice my lord and brethren though i depart for court my love shall rest with you as heretofore a faithful guest i now must sleep in court sound sleeps forbear the chamberlain to state is public care yet in this rising of my private blood my studious thoughts shall tend the city's good enter crofts how now crofts what news my lord his highness sends express command that a record be entered of this riot and that the chief and capital offenders be thereon straight arraigned for himself intends to sit in person on the rest to-morrow at westminster lord mayor you hear your charge come good sir thomas moore to court let's hie you are the appeaser of this mutiny my lord farewell new days begets new tides 
life whirls about fate then to a grave it slides exeunt severally end of act two three of sir thomas more by anthony munday this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org act three scene one cheapside enter master sheriff and meet a messenger messenger what news is execution yet performed not yet the carts stand ready at the stairs and they shall presently away to tyburn stay master shreve it is the council's pleasure for more example in so bad a case a gibbet be erected in cheapside hard by the standard whether you must bring lincoln and those that were the chief with him enter officers to suffer death and that immediately it shall be done sir exit messenger officers be speedy Call for a gibbet. See it be erected. Others make haste to Newgate. Bid them bring the prisoners hither, for they here must die. Away, I say, and see no time be slacked. We, we go, go, sir. Exit some severally. Others set up the gibbet. That's well said, fellow. Now you do your duty. God, for his pity, help these troublous times. The streets stopped up with the gazing multitudes. Command our armed officers with halberds make way for entrance of the prisoners let proclamation once again be made that every householder on pain of death keep in his presences and every man stand with weapon ready at his door as he will answer to the contrary i'll see it done sir exit enter another officer bring them away to execution the rich is come above two hours since the city will be fined for a disneglect. There's such a press and multitude at Newgate. They cannot bring the carts onto the stairs to take the prisoners in. Then let them come on foot. We may not dally time with great command. Some of the bench, sir, think it very fit that stay be made and give it out abroad. The execution is deferred till morning, and when the streets shall be a little cleared, to chain them up and suddenly dispatch it. Stay. In meantime, methinks they come along see they are coming so tis very well the prisoners are brought in well guarded bring lincoln there the first unto the tree ay for i cry lug sir i knew the first sir did belong to me this the old proverb now complete doth make that lincoln should be hanged for london's sake he goes up a god's name let us to work fellow dispatch i was a foremost man in this rebellion and I the foremost that must die for it. Bravely, John Lincoln, let thy death express that, as thou livest a man, thou diest no less. Dull Williamson, thine eyes shall witness it. Then to all you that come to view mine end, I must confess, I had no ill intent, but against such as wronged us overmuch. And now I can perceive it was not fit that private men should carve out their redress. Which way they list? No. Learn it now by me. Obedience is the best in each degree. And asking mercy meekly of my king, I patiently submit me to the law. But God forgive them that were cause of it. And as a Christian, truly from my heart, I likewise crave they would forgive me too, as freely as I do forgive their wrong that others, by example of the same, henceforth be warned to attempt the like gainst any alien that repaireth hither. Fare ye well, all. The next time that we meet, I trust in heaven, we shall each other greet. He leaps off. Farewell, John Lincoln. Say all what they can. Thou lipst a good fellow, and diest an honest man. What I wear so fair on my journey, the first stretch is the worst, methinks. Bring Williamson there forward. Good Master Shreve, I have an earnest suit, and as you are a man, deny it me not. Woman, what is it? Be it in my power, thou shalt obtain it. Let me die next, sir, that is all I crave. You know not what a comfort you shall bring to my poor heart, to die before my husband. 
Bring her to death. She shall have her desire. Sir, and I have a suit for you, too. What is it? That, as you have hanged Lincoln first, and will hang her next, so you will not hang me at all. Nay, you set up the counter gates, and you must hang for the folly. Well, then, so much for it. Sir, your free bounty much contents my mind. Commend me to that good shrieve Master Moore, and tell him, had it not been for his persuasion, John Lincoln had not hung here as he does, we would first have locked us up in Lednor, and there have been burnt to ashes with the roof. Woman, what Master Moore did was a subject's duty, and hath so pleased our gracious lord the king, that he is hence removed to higher place, and made of counsel to his majesty. Well, he is worthy of it by my troth, an honest, wise, well-spoken gentleman. Yet would I praise his honesty much more if he had kept his word and saved our lives. But let that pass. Men are but men, and so words are but words, and pays not what men owe. You, husband, since perhaps the world may say that through my means thou comest thus to thy end, here I begin this cup of death to thee, because thou shalt be sure to taste no worse than I have taken that must go before thee. What though I be a woman, that's no matter. I do owe God a death, and I must pay him. Husband, give me thy hand. Be not dismayed. This chair being chaired, then all our debt is paid. Only two little babes we leave behind us, and all I can bequeath them at this time is but the love of some good honest friend to bring them up in charitable sort. What, masters? He goes upright that never halts, and they may live to mend their parents' faults. Why, well said, wife. If faith thou cheerest my heart, give me thy hand. Let's kiss, and so let's part. He kisses her on the ladder. The next kiss, Williamson, shall be in heaven. Now cheerily, lads, George bets a hand with thee, and thine too, Rafe, and thine, good honest Sherwin. Now let me tell the women of this town, no stranger yet brought doll to lying down, so long as I an Englishman can see, nor French nor Dutch shall get a kiss of me, and when that I am dead, for me yet say, I died in scorn to be a stranger's prey. A great shout and noise, cry within, pardon, 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 pardon. Room for the Earl of Surrey, room there, room. Enter Surrey. Save the man's life, if it be possible. It is too late, my lord. He is dead already. I tell thee, Master Sheriff, you are too forward to make such haste with men unto their death. I think your pains will merit little thanks, since that his highness is so merciful as not to spill the blood of any subject. My noble lord, would we so much had known. The council's warrant hastened our dispatch. It had not else been done so suddenly. Sir Thomas More, humbly upon his knee, did beg the lives of all, since on his word they did so gently yield. The king hath granted it, and made him Lord High Chancellor of England, according as he worthily deserves. Since Lincoln's life cannot be had again, then for the rest from my dread sovereign's lips I here pronounce free pardon for them all. God, God save, save the king! king. God, God save the king! king. My, My good Lord, Lord Chancellor, Chancellor, and the Earl of Surrey. Flinging up caps. And Doll desires it from her very heart. Moore's name may live for this right noble part. And whensoe'er we talk of ill May Day, praise Moore. In hope his highness clemency and mercy, which in the arms of mild and meek compassion would rather clip you, as the loving nurse oft doth the wayward infant than to leave you to the sharp rod of justice, so to draw you to shun such lewd assemblies as beget unlawful riots and such traitorous acts that striking with the hand of private hate maim your dear country with a public wound o oh god that mercy whose majestic brow should be unwrinkled and that awful justice which looketh through a veil of sufferance upon the frailty of the multitude should with the clamours of outrageous wrongs be stirred and wakened thus to punishment but your deserved death he doth forgive who gives you life pray all he long may live god, god save, save the king, king. God, god save, save the, the king. king my, my good, good lord chancellor and the earl of surrey, surrey. exeunt scene two chelsea a room in moore's house a table being covered with a green carpet a state cushion on it, 
and the purse and mace lying thereon. Enter Sir Thomas More. It is in heaven that I am thus and thus, and that which we profanely term our fortunes is the provision of the power above, fitted and shaped just to that strength of nature which we are born withal. Good God! Good God, that I, from such an humble bench of birth, should step as twere up to my country's head, and give the law out there. I, in my father's life, to take prerogative, and tithe of knees from elder kinsmen, and him bind by my place to give the smooth and dexter way to me, that owe it him by nature. Sure, these things, not physicked by respect, might turn our blood to much corruption. But more, the more thou hast either of honor, office, wealth, and calling, which might excite thee to embrace and hug them, the more do thou in serpents' natures think them. Fear their gray skins with thought of their sharp state. And let this be thy maxim, to be great is when the thread of heyday is once spun, a bottom great would up great undone. Come on, sir, are you ready? Enter Randall, attired like Sir Thomas More. Yes, my lord. I stand but on a few points. I shall have done presently. Before God, I have practised your lordship's shift so well, that I think I shall grow proud, my lord. Tis fit thou shouldst wax proud, or else thou'lt ne'er be allied to greatness. Observe me, sirrah, the learned clerk Erasmus is arrived within our English court. Last night I hear he feasted with our honoured English poet, the Earl of Surrey. And I learn to-day the famous clerk of Rotterdam will visit Sir Thomas More. Therefore, sir, take my seat. You are Lord Chancellor. Dress your behaviour according to my carriage, but beware you talk not over much, for it will betray thee, who prates not much seems wise, his wit few scan, while the tongue blabs tales of the imperfect man. I'll see if great Erasmus can distinguish merit and outward ceremony. If I do not serve a share for playing of your lordship well, let me be a yeoman usher to your sumter, and be banished from wearing a gold chain for ever. Well, sir, I'll hide our motion. Act my part with a firm boldness, and thou winst my heart. Enter the shreve, with Faulkner, a ruffian, and officers. How now? What's the matter? Tuck me not, I'm no bear. It's blood if all the dogs in Paris garden hung at my tail, I'd shake him off with this that I'll appear before no king christened, but my good lord chancellor. We'll christen you, sirrah. Bring him forward. How now? What tumults make you? The azured heavens protect my noble lord chancellor. What fellow's this? A ruffian, my lord, that hath set half the city in an uproar. My lord? There was a fray in Paternoster Row, and because they would not be parted, the street was choked up with carts. My noble lord! Upon your ally's throat was open. Sir, hold your peace. I'll prove the street was not choked, but is as well as ever it was since it was a street. This fellow was a principal broacher of the broil. S blood, I broached none. It was broached and half run out before I had a lick at it. And would be brought before no justice but your honour. I am hailed, my noble lord. No ear to choose for every trivial noise but mine and in so full a time away you wrong me master shreve dispose of him at your own pleasure send the knave to newgate to newgate s'blood sir thomas more i appeal i appeal from newgate to any of the two worshipful counters fellow whose man are you that are thus lusty my name's jack faulkner i serve next under god and my prince master morris secretary to my lord of winchester a fellow of your hair is very fit to be a secretary's follower i hope so my lord the fray was between the bishop's men of ely and winchester 
and I could not in honour but part them. I thought it stood not with my reputation and degree to come to my questions and answers before a city justice. I knew I should to the pot. Thou hast been there, it seems, too late already. I know your honour is wise, and so forth, and I desire to be only cathesized or examined by you, my noble Lord Chancellor. Sir, sir, you are a busy, dangerous ruffian. Ruffian? How long have you worn this hair? I have worn this hair ever since I was born. You know that's not my question. But how long hath this shag fleece hung dangling on thy head? How long, my lord? Why, sometimes thus long, sometimes lower, as the fates and humours please. So quick, sir, with me, huh? I see, good fellow, that thou lovest plain dealing. Sir, tell me now, when were you last at Barber's? How long time have you upon your head worn this shag hair? My lord, Jack Faulkner tells no ace of fables. Troth, I was not at Barber's these three years. I have not been cut, not will not be cut, upon a foolish vow, which as the destinies shall direct, I am sworn to keep. When comes that vow out? Why, when the humours are purged, not these three years. Vows are recorded in the court of heaven, for they are holy acts. Young man, I charge thee, and do advise thee, start not from that vow. And, for I will be sure, thou shalt not shrieve, besides, because it is an odious sight to see a man thus hairy, thou shalt lie in Newgate till thy vow, and thy three years be full expired away with him my lord cut off this fleece and lie there but a month i'll not lose a hair to be lord chancellor of europe to newgate then sir great sins are bred in all that body where there's a foul head away with him exeunt all except randall enter surrey erasmus and attendants now great erasmus you approach the presence of a most worthy learned gentleman this little isle holds not a truer friend unto the arts, nor doth his greatness add a feigned flourish to his worthy parts. He's great in study. That's the statist's grace that gains more reverence than the outward place. Report, my lord, has crossed the narrow seas, and to the several parts of Christendom has borne the fame of your lord chancellor. I long to see him, whom with loving thoughts I in my study oft have visited. Is that Sir Thomas More? It is, Erasmus. Now shall you view the honourablest scholar, the most religious politician, the worthiest counsellor that tends our state. That study is the general watch of England. In it the prince's safety and the peace that shines upon our commonwealth are forged by loyal industry i doubt him not to be as near the life of excellence as you proclaim him when his meanest servants are of some weight you saw my lord his porter give entertainment to us at the gate in latin good phrase what's the master then when such good parts shine in his meanest men his lordship hath some weighty business for see yet he takes no notice of us I think it were best I did my duty to him in a short Latin speech. Qui in celeberima patria natus est et gloriosa, plus habit negotii ut in lucem veniat, quam qui? I prithee, good Erasmus, be covered. I have forsworn speaking of Latin, else, as I am true counsellor, I would tickle you with a speech. Nay, nee, said Erasmus, said good my lord of surrey i'll make my lady come to you anon if she will and give you entertainment is this sir thomas more oh good erasmus you must conceive his vein he's ever furnished with these conceits yes faith my learned poet doth not lie for that matter i am neither more nor less than merry sir thomas always will sup with me by god I a parlous wise fellow that smells of a politician better than a long progress. Enter Sir Thomas More. We are deluded. This is not his lordship. I pray you, Erasmus, 
how long will holland cheese in your country keep without maggots fool painted barbarism retire thyself into thy first creation exit randall thus you see my loving learned friends how far respect waits often on the ceremonious train of base illiterate wealth whilst men of schools shrouded in poverty are counted fools pardon thou reverend german i have mixed so slight a jest to the fair entertainment of thy most worthy self for no erasmus mirth wrinkles up my face and i still crave what that forsakes me i may hug my grave your honour's merry humour is best physic unto your able body for we learn where melancholy chokes the passages of blood and breast the erected spirit still lengthens our days with sportful exercise study should be the saddest time of life the rest a sport exempt from tort of strife erasmus preacheth gospel against physic my noble poet oh my lord you tax me in that word poet of much idleness it is a study that makes poor our fate poets were ever thought unfit for state o oh, give up not fair poesy sweet lord to such contempt that i may speak my heart it is the sweetest heraldry of art that sets a difference between the tough sharp holly and tender bay tree yet my lord it has become the very logic number to all mechanic sciences why i'll show the reason this is no age for poets they should sing to the loud canon heroica facta qui faciant reges heroica carmina laudant and as great subjects of their pen decay even so unphysicked they do melt away enter master morris come will your lordship in my dear erasmus i'll hear you master morris presently my lord i make you master of my house we'll banquet here with fresh and state delights the muses music here shall cheer our sprites and the cates must be but mean where scholars sit for they're made all with courses of neat wit <laughs> exeunt surrey erasmus and attendants and now master morris i am a suitor to your lordship in behalf of a servant of mine the fellow with long hair good master morris come to me three years hence and i'll hear you i understand your honour but the foolish knave has submitted himself to the mercy of a barber and is without ready to make a new vow before your lordship hereafter to leave cavil nay then let's talk with him pray call him in enter falconer and officers bless your honour a new man my lord why sure this is not he and your lordship will the barber shall give you a sample of my head i am he in faith my lord i am ipse why now thy face is like an honest man's thou hast played well at this new cut and won no my lord lost all that ever god sent me god sent thee into the world as thou art now with a short hair how quickly are three years run out of newgate i think so my lord for there was but a hair's length between my going thither and so long time because i see some grace in thee go free discharge him fellows farewell master morris thy head is for thy shoulders now more fit thou hast less hair upon it but more wit exit did i not tell thee always of these locks and the locks were on again all the goldsmiths in cheapside should not pick them open it's hard if my hair stand not on end when i look for my face in a glass i am a pole cut here's a lousy jest but if i notch not that rogue tom barber that makes me look thus like a brownist hang me i'll be worse to the nitical knave than ten tooth drawings here's a head with a pox what ails thou art thou mad now mad now nails if loss of hair cannot mad a man what can i am deposed my crown is taken from me more had been better a scoured mortgage than a notched me thus does he begin ship shearing with jack faulkner nay and you feed this vein sir fare you well 
why farewell frost i'll go hang myself out for the pole head make a saracen of jack thou desperate knave for that i see the devil wholly gets hold of thee the devil's a damned rascal i charge thee wait on me no more no more call me thy master why then a word master morris i'll hear no word sir fare you well Sblad, farewell why dost thou follow me because i'm an ass do you set your shavers upon me and then cast me off must i gondole have the fates played the fools am i their cut now the poor sconce is taken must jack march with bag and baggage weeps you coxcomb nay you have poached me you have given me a hair it's here here away you kind ass come sir dry your eyes keep you old place and mend these fooleries i cared not to be turned off and it were a ladder so it be in my humour or the fates beckon to me nay pray sir if the destiny spin me a fine thread faulkner flies another pitch and to avoid the headache hereafter before i'll be a hairmonger i'll be a whoremonger exeunt scene three chelsea antechamber in moore's house enter a messenger to moore my honourable lord the mayor of london accompanied with his lady and her train are coming hither and are hard at hand to feast with you as servants come before to tell your lordship of their near approach why this is cheerful news friends go and come reverend erasmus who delicious words expressed the very soul of life and wit newly took sad leave of me and with tears troubled the silver channels of the thames which glad of such a burden proudly swelled and on her bosom bore him toward the sea he's gone to rotterdam peace go with him he left me heavy when he went from hence but this recomforts me the kind lord mayor his brethren aldermen with their fair wives will feast this night with us why so it should be moore's merry heart lives by good company good gentlemen be careful give great charge our diet be made dainty for the taste for of all people that the earth affords the londoners fare richest at their boards exeunt end of act three More of Sir Thomas More by Anthony Munday. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Four, Scene One, Chelsea, a room in More's house. Enter Sir Thomas More, Master Roper, and serving men setting stools. Come, my good fellows stir be diligent sloth is an idle fellow leave him now the time requires your expeditious service uh, place me here stools to set the ladies on uh, son roper you have given order for the banquet i have my lord and everything is ready enter his lady oh welcome wife give you direction how women should be placed you know it best for my lord mayor his brethren and the rest let me alone men can best order men i warrant ye my lord all shall be well there's one without that stays to speak with ye and bade me tell ye that he is a player a player wife one of ye bid him come in exit one nay stir there fellows fie ye are too slow see that your lights be in a readiness the banquet shall be here God's me, madam. Leave my lady mayoress, both of us from the board. And my son Roper, too. What may our guests think? My lord, they are risen and sitting by the fire. Why, yet go you and keep them company. It is not meet we should be absent to both. Exit, lady. Enter player. Ah, welcome, good friend. What is you will with me? My lord, my fellows, and myself are come to tender ye our willing service, so please you to command us. What, for a play you mean? Whom do ye serve? 
my lord cardinal's grace ah my lord cardinal's players now trust me welcome you happen hither in a lucky time to pleasure me and benefit yourselves the mayor of london and some aldermen his ladies and their wives are my kind guests this night at supper now to have a play before the banquet will be excellent how think you son roper twill do well my lord in the right pleasing pastime to your guests i prithee tell me what plays have ye diverse my lord the cradle of security his nail o the head impatient poverty the play of four peas dives and lazarus lusty juventus and the marriage of wit and wisdom ah the marriage of wit and wisdom that my lads i'll none but that the theme is very good and may maintain a liberal argument to marry wit to wisdom as some cunning many have wit that may come short of wisdom we'll see how master poet plays his part and whether wit or wisdom grace his art go make him drink and all his fellows too how many are ye four men and a boy sir but one boy then i see there's but few women in the play three my lord dame science lady vanity and wisdom she herself and one boy play them all by our lady he's laden well my good fellow get ye straight together and make ye ready with what haste ye may proud their supper gainst the play be done else shall we stay our guests here over long make haste i pray ye we will my lord exit servant and player where are the weights go beg them play to spend the time a while enter lady how now madam my lord they are coming hither thou art welcome wife i'll tell ye one thing one sport is somewhat mended we shall have a play to-night the marriage of wit and wisdom enacted by my good lord cardinal's players how like ye that wife my lord i like it well see they are coming the waits plays enter lord mayor so many aldermen as may the lady mayoress in scarlet with other ladies and sir thomas moore's daughters servants carrying lighted torches by them once again welcome welcome my good lord mayor and brethren of all for once i was your brother and so i am still in heart it is not state that can our love from london separate true upstart fools by sudden fortune tried regard their former mates with naught but pride but they that cast an eye still whence they came know how they rose and how to use the same my lord you set a gloss on london's fame and make it happy ever by your name needs must we say when we remember more twas he that drove rebellion from our door with grave discretions mild and gentle breath oh how our city is by you renowned and with your virtues our endeavours crowned no more my good lord mayor but thanks to all that on so short a summons you would come to visit him that holds your kindness dear madam you are not merry with my lady mayoress and these fair ladies uh, pray seat them all and here my lord let me appoint your place uh, the rest seat yourselves nay i'll weary ye you will not long in haste to visit me good madam sit in sooth you shall sit here good madam pardon me it may not be in troth i'll have it so i'll sit here by ye good lady sit more stools here ho it is your favour madam make me thus presume above my merit when we come to you then shall you rule us as we rule you here now i must tell ye madam we have a play to welcome ye withal how good so e'er that know not i my lord will have it so wife hope the best i am sure they'll do their best they that would be better comes not at their feast my good lord cardinal's players i thank them for it play us a play to lengthen out your welcome they say it is the marriage of wit and wisdom a theme of some import howe'er it prove 
but if art fail we'll inch it out with love enter a servant what are they ready my lord one of the players craves to speak with you with me where is he enter inclination the vice ready here my lord how now what's the matter we would desire your honour but to stay a little one of my fellows is but run to ogles for a long beard for young wit and he'll be here presently a long beard for young wit why man he may be without a beard till he come to marriage for wit goes not all by the hair when comes wit in in the second scene next to the prologue my lord why play on till that scene come and by that time wit's beard will be grown or else the fellow returned with it and what part plays thou inclination the vice my lord <laughs> gramercies now i may take the vice if i list and wherefore hast thou that bridle in thy hand i must be bridled anon my lord and thou beest not saddled too it makes no matter for then wit's inclination may gallop so fast that he will outstrip wisdom and fall to folly uh, indeed so he does to lady vanity uh, but we have no folly in our play then there's no wit in it i'll be sworn folly waits on wit as the shadow on the body and where wit is ripest there folly still is radiest and begin i prithee will rather allow a beardless wit than wit all beard to have no brain nay he has his apparel on too my lord and therefore he is the readier to enter then good inclination begin at a venter exit inclination my lord mayor wit lacks a beard or else they would begin i'd lend him mine but that it is too thin silence they come the trumpet sounds enter the prologue now for as much as in these latter days throughout the whole world in every land vice doth increase and virtue decays iniquity having the upper hand we therefore intend good gentle audience a pretty short interlude to play at this present desiring your leave and quiet silence to show the same as is meet and expedient it is called the marriage of wit and wisdom a matter right pithy and pleasing to hear whereof in brief we'll show the whole sum but i must be gone for wit doth appear exit enter wit ruffling and inclination the vice in an arbour green asleep whereas i lay the birds sang sweetly in the midst of the day i dreamed fast of mirth and play in youth is pleasure in youth is pleasure methought i walked still to and fro and from her company i could not go but when i waked it was not so in youth is pleasure in youth is pleasure therefore my heart is surely plight of her alone to have a sight which is my joy and heart's delight in youth is pleasure in youth is pleasure mark ye my lord this is wit without a beard what will he be by the time he comes to the commodity of a beard O oh, sir, the ground is the better on which she doth go, for she will make better cheer with a little she can get than many a one can with a great banquet of meat. And is her name Wisdom? Aye, sir, a wife most fit for you, my good master, my dainty sweet wit. To be in her company, my heart it is set. Therefore I prithee to let us be gone, for unto Wisdom wit hath inclination. O oh, sir, she will come herself even anon, for I told her before where we would stand, and then she said she would beck us with her hand. Back with these boys and saucy great knaves. Flourishing a dagger.
what stand ye here so big in your braves my dagger about your coxcombs shall walk if i may but so much as hear ye chat or talk but will she take pains to come for us hither i warrant ye therefore you must be familiar with her when she cometh in place you must her embrace somewhat handsomely lest she think it danger because you're a stranger to come in your company i warrant the inclination i will be busy oh how wit longs to be in wisdom's company enter lady vanity singing and beckoning with her hand come hither come hither come hither come such cheer as i have thou shalt have some ah this is lady vanity i'll hold my life beware good wit you take not her to wife what unknown honesty a word in your ear she offers to depart you shall not be gone as yet i swear here's none but friends you need not to fray this young gentleman loves ye therefore you must stay i trust in me she will think no danger for i love well the company of fair women and though to you i am a stranger yet wit may pleasure you now and then who you nay you are such a holy man that to touch on you dare not be bold i think you would not kiss a young woman if one would give you twenty pound of gold yes in good sadness lady that i would i could find in my heart to kiss you in your smock my back is broad enough to bear that mock for it hath been told me many a time that you would be seen in no such company as mine not wit in the company of lady wisdom oh jove for what do i hither come sir she did this nothing else but to prove whether a little thing would you move to be angry and fret what and if one said so let such trifling matters go and with a kind kiss come out of her debt oh is luggins come yet with the beard enter another player no faith he is not come alas what shall we do forsooth we can go no further till our fellow luggins come for he plays good counsel and now he should enter to admonish wit that this is lady vanity and not lady wisdom nay and it be no more but so ye shall not tarry at a stand for that we'll not have our play marred for lack of a little good at counsel till your fellow come i'll give him the best counsel i can pardon me my lord mayor i love to be merry o oh, wit thou art now on the bow hand and blindly in thine own opinion dost stand i tell thee this not elude inclination does lead thee amiss in a very strange fashion this is not wisdom but lady vanity therefore list to good counsel and be ruled by me in troth my lord it is as right to luggins's part as can be speak wit nay we will not have our audience disappointed if i can help it art thou good counsel and wilt tell me so wouldst thou have wit from lady wisdom to go thou art some deceiver i tell thee verily in saying that this is lady vanity wit judge not things by the outward show the eye oft mistakes right well you do know good counsel assures thee upon his honesty that this is not wisdom but lady vanity enter logans with the beard oh my lord he is come now we shall go forward art thou come well fellow i have hoped to save thine honesty a little now if thou canst give wit any better counsel than i have done spare not there i leave him to thy mercy but by this time i am sure our banquet's ready my lord and ladies we will taste that first and then they shall begin the play again which through the fellow's absence and by me instead of helping hath been hindered prepare against we come lights there i say thus fools oft times do help to mar the play exeunt all but players fie fellow luggins you serve us handsomely do ye not think ye why ogle was not within and his wife would not let me have the beard 
and by my troth i ran so fast that i sweat again do you hear fellows would not my lord make a rare player oh he would uphold a company beyond all hope better than mason among the king's players did you mark how extemporically he fell to the matter and spake luggins's part almost as it is in the very book set down peace do ye know what ye say my lord a player let us not meddle with any such matters yet i may be a little proud that my lord hath answered me in my part but come let us go and be ready to begin the play again ay that's the best for now we lack nothing enter a serving man where be these players here yes, sir my lord is sent for to the court and all the guests do after supper part and for he will not trouble you again by me for your reward ascends eight angels with many thanks but sup before you go it is his will you should be fairly entreated follow i pray ye this luggins is your negligence wanting wit's beard brought things into dislike for otherwise the play had been all seen where now some curious citizen disgraced it and discommending it all is dismissed for god us says true but hear ye sirs eight angels ha my lord would never give eight angels more or less for twelve pence other it should be three pounds five pounds or ten pounds there's twenty shillings wanting sure twenty to one tis so i have a trick my lord comes stand aside enter more with attendants with purse and mace in haste to counsel what's the business now that all so late his highness sends for me what seekest thou fellow nay nothing your lordship sent eight angels by your man and i have lost two of them in the rishes wit look to that eight angels i did send them ten who gave it them i my lord i had no more about me but by and by they shall rescue the rest well wit twas wisely done thou playest wit well indeed not to be thus deceived of thy right am i a man by office truly ordained equally to decide true right his own and shall i have deceivers in my house then what avails my bounty when such servants deceive the poor of what the master gives go on and pull his coat over his ears there are too many such give them their right wit let thy fellows thank thee twas well done thou now deservest to match with lady wisdom exit moore with attendants god a mercy wit sir you had a master sir thomas moore more but now we shall have more god bless him i would there were more of his mind a loves our quality and yet he's a learned man and knows what the world is well a kind man and more loving than many other but i think we have met with the first first served his man that had our angels and he may chance dine with duke humphrey to-morrow being turned away to-day come let's go and many such rewards would make us all ride and horse us with the best nags in smithfield Exeunt. Scene two, Whitehall, the council chamber. Enter the earls of Shrewsbury, Surrey, Bishop of Rochester, and other lords, severally doing courtesy to each other. Clerk of the council, waiting bareheaded. Good morrow to my lord of Shrewsbury. But like unto the honoured earl of Surrey. Yond comes my lord of Rochester. Good morrow, my good lords. Clock of the council, what time is of day? Past eight of clock, my lord. I wonder that my good lord chancellor doth stay so long, considering there's matters of high importance to be scanned upon. Clock of the council, certify his lordship the lords expect him here. It shall not need. Yond comes his lordship. Enter Sir Thomas More, with purse and mace borne before him. Good morrow to this fair assembly. Come, my good lords, let's sit. O serious square they sit upon this little board is daily scanned the health and preservation of the land 
we the physicians that effect this good now by choice diet a non by letting blood our toil and careful watching brings the king and league with slumbers to which peace doth sing avoid the room there what business lords to-day this my good lord about the entertainment of the emperor gainst the perfidious french into our pay my lords as tis the custom in this place the youngest should speak first so if i chance in this case to speak youngly pardon me i will agree france now hath her full strength as having new recovered the pale blood which war sluiced forth and i consent to this that the conjunction of our english forces with arms of germany may soon bring this prize of conquest in but then my lords as in the moral hunting twixt the lion and other beasts force joined with greed frighted the weaker sharers from their parts so if the empire's sovereign chance to put his plea of partnership into war's court swords should decide the difference and our blood in private tears lament his entertainment to doubt the worst is still the wise man's shield that arms him safely but the world knows this the emperor is a man of royal faith his love unto our sovereign brings him down from his imperial seat to march in pay under our english flag and wear the cross like some high order on his manly breast thus serving he's not master of himself but like a colonel commanding other is by the general overawed himself yet my good lord let me conclude my speech as subjects share no portion in the conquest of their true sovereign other than the merit that from the sovereign girdens the true subject so the good emperor in a friendly league of amity with england will not soil his honour with the theft of english spoil there is no question but this entertainment will be most honourable most commodious i have oft heard good captains wish to have rich soldiers to attend them such as would fight both for their lives and livings such a one is the good emperor i would to god we had ten thousand of such able men ah then there would appear no court no city but where the wars were they would pay themselves then to prevent in french wars england's loss let german flags wave with our english cross enter sir thomas palmer my lords his majesty hath sent me these articles enclosed first to be viewed and then to be subscribed to i tender them in that due reverence which befits this place with great reverence subscribe these articles stay let us pause our conscience first shall parley with our laws my lord of rochester view you the paper subscribe to these now good sir thomas palmer beseech the king that he will pardon me my heart will check my hand whilst i do write subscribing so i were an hypocrite do you refuse it then my lord i do sir thomas then here i summon you forthwith to appear before his majesty to answer there this capital contempt i rise and part in lieu of this to tender him my heart he riseth wilt please your honour to subscribe my lord sir tell his highness i entreat some time for to bethink me of this task in the meanwhile i do resign mine office into my sovereign's hands then my lord hear the prepared order from the king on your refusal you shall straight depart unto your house at chelsea till you know our sovereign's further pleasure most willingly i go my lords if you will visit me at chelsea we'll go a-fishing and with a cunning net not like weak film we'll catch none but the great farewell my noble lords why this is right good morrow to the sun to state good night exit moore will you subscribe my lords instantly good sir thomas will bring the writing unto our sovereign they write my lord of rochester you must with me to answer this contempt this is the worst whose freed from life is from all care exempt 
Exit Rochester and Palmer. Now let us hasten to our sovereign. Tis strange that my Lord Chancellor should refuse the duty that the law of God bequeaths unto the king. Come, let us in. No doubt his mind will alter, and the bishops too. Error in learned heads hath much to do. Exeunt. Scene three. Chelsea. Enter the Lady Moor, her two daughters, and Master Roper, as walking. Madam, what ails ye for to look so sad? Troth, son, I know not what. I am not sick, and yet I am not well. I would be merry, but somewhat lies so heavy on heart I cannot choose but sigh. You are a scholar. I pray ye, tell me, may one credit dreams? Why ask you that, dear madam? Because to-night I had the strangest dream that e'er my sleep was troubled with. Methought twas night, and that the king and queen went on the Thames in barges to hear music. My lord and I were in a little boat, methought. Lord, Lord, what strange things live in slumbers! And being near, we grappled to the barge that bare the king. But after many pleasing voices spent in that still moving music house, methought the violence of the stream did sever us quite from the golden fleet, and hurried us unto the bridge which with unused horror we entered at full tide. Thence some slight shoot being carried by the waves, our boat stood still just opposite the tower, and there it turned and turned about, as when a whirlpool sucks the circled waters. We thought that we both cried, till that we sunk, where arm in arm we died. Give no respect, dear madam, to fond dreams, there are but slight illusions of the blood. Tell me not all are so, for often dreams are true diviners, either of good or ill. I cannot be inquired till I hear how my lord fares. Aside, no, it. Come hither, wife. I will not fright thy mother to interpret the nature of a dream, but trust me, sweet, this night I have been troubled with thy father beyond all thought. Truly, and so have I. Methought I saw him here in Chelsea Church, standing upon the rood loft, now defaced. And whilst he kneeled and prayed before the image, it fell with him into the upper choir, where my poor father lay all stained in blood. Our dreams all meet in one conclusion, fatal, I fear. What's that you talk? I pray ye let me know it. Nothing, good mother. This is your fashion still. I must know nothing. Call Master Catesby. He shall straight to court, and see how my lord does. I shall not rest until my heart leave panting on his breast. Enter Sir Thomas More merrily, servants attending. See where my father comes, joyful and merry. As seamen having passed a troubled storm, dance on the pleasant shore. So I, oh, I could speak now like a poet. Now for God I am passing light. Wife! Give me kind welcome. Thou wast one to blame my kissing when my beard was in the stubble, but I have been trimmed of late. I have had a smooth court shaving, and good faith I have. Daughters kneel. God bless ye. Son Roper, give me your hand. Your honor is welcome home. Honor. <laughs> and how dost wife? He bears himself most strangely. Will your lordship in? Lordship? No, wife, that's gone. The ground was slight that we did lean upon. Lord, that your honour ne'er will leave these jests. In faith it ill becomes ye. Oh, good wife, honour and jests are both together fled. The merriest counsellor of England's dead. Who's that, my lord? <laughs> Still lord. The lord chancellor, wife. That's you. Certain. But I have changed my life. Am I not leaner than I was before? <laughs> the fat is gone, my title's only more. Contented with one style, I'll live at rest. They that have many names are not still best. I have resigned mine office, count'st me not wise? Oh, God! Come, breed not female children in your eyes. The king will have it so. What's the offence? Tush, let that pass. We'll talk of that anon. The king seems a physician to my fate. His princely mind would train me back to state. 
then be his patient, my most honored father. O oh, San Roper, ubi tupus es medicine sanare beget. No wife, be merry, and be merry all. You smiled at rising, weep not at my fall. Let's in and hear joy like to private friends, since days of pleasure have repentant ends. The light of greatness is with triumph born, it sets at midday oft with public scorn. Scene four the tower. Enter the Bishop of Rochester, Surrey, Shrewsbury, Lieutenant of the Tower, and Warders with weapons. Your kind persuasions, honourable lords, I can but thank ye for, but in this breast there lives a soul that aims at higher things than temporary pleasing earthly kings. God bless his highness even with all my heart. We shall meet one day, though that now we part. We not misdoubt your wisdom can discern what best befits it. Yet in love and zeal we could entreat it might be otherwise. No doubt your fatherhood will by yourself consider better of the present case, and grow as great in favor as before. For that as pleaseth God, in my restraint from worldly causes, I shall better see into myself than at proud liberty. The tower and I will privately confer of things, wherein at freedom I may err. But I am troublesome unto your honors, and hold ye longer than becomes my duty. Master Lieutenant, I am now your charge, and though you keep my body, yet my love waits on my king and you while Fisher lives. Farewell, my lord of Rochester. We'll pray for your release, and labor it as we may. Thereof assure yourself. So do we leave ye, and to your happy private thoughts bequeath ye. Exeunt Lords. Now, Master Lieutenant, on. A God's name, go. And with as glad a mind go I with you, as ever truant bade the school adieu. Exeunt. Scene five. Chelsea. A room in Moore's house. Enter Sir Thomas Moore, his lady, daughters, Master Roper, gentlemen, and servants, as in his house at Chelsea. Good morrow, son Roper. Sit good, madam, upon an humble seat. Low stools. The time so craves. Rest your good heart on earth, the roof of graves. You see, the floor of greatness is uneven. The cricket and high throne alike near heaven. And now, daughters, you that like to branches spread and give best shadow to a private house, be comforted, my girls. Your hope stands fair. Virtue breeds gentry, she makes the best air. Good morrow to your honor. Nay, good night, rather. Your honor's crest fain with your happy father. Oh, what formality, what square observance, lives in the little room. Here public care gags not the eye of slumber, here fierce riot ruffles not proudly in a coat of trust, whilst, like a pawn at chess, he keeps in rank with kings and mighty fellows. Yet, indeed, those men that stand on tiptoe smile to see him pawn his fortunes. True, son. Nor does the wanton tongue here screw itself into the ear that like a vice drinks up the iron instrument. We are here at peace. Then peace, good wife. For keeping still in compass, a strange point in time's new navigation we have sailed beyond our course. Have done. We are exiled the court. Still thou harpest on that. Tis sin for to deserve that banishment. But he that ne'er knew court, court sweet content. Oh, but dear husband. I will not hear thee, wife. Thy winding labyrinth of thy strange discourse will ne'er have end. Sit still. My good wife, entreat thy tongue be still, or credit me thou shalt not understand a word we speak. We'll talk in Latin. Humida valis raros patitur fulminis ictus. More rest enjoys the subject meanly bred than he that bears the kingdom in his head. Great men are still musicians, else the world lies. They learn low strains after the notes that rise. Good sir, be still yourself, and but remember how in this general court of short lived pleasure the world creation in the ample food that is digested in a month of time. If man himself be subject to such ruin, 
how shall his garment then or the loose points that i respect unto his awful place avoid destruction most honored father-in-law the blood you have bequeathed these several hearts to nourish your prosperity stands firm and as with joy you let us first to rise so with like hearts will lock performance eyes close them not then with tears for that ostent gives a wet signal of your discontent if you will share my fortunes comfort then an hundred smiles for one sigh what we are men resign wet passion to these weaker eyes which proves their sex but grants it ne'er more wise let's now survey our state here sits my wife and dear esteemed issue yonder stand my loving servants now the difference twixt those and these now you shall hear me speak like more in melancholy i conceive that nature hath sundry metals out of which she frames us mortals each in valuation outprising other of the finest stuff the finest features come the rest of earth receive base fortune even before their birth hence slaves have their creation and i think nature provides content for the base mind under the whip the burden and the toil their low wrought bodies drudge in patience as for the prince in all his sweet gorged maw and his rank flesh that sinfully renews the noon's excess in the night's dangerous surfeits what means or misery from our birth doth flow nature entitles to us that we owe but we being subject to the rack of hate falling from happy life to bondage state having seen better days now know the lack of glory that once reared each high-fed back but you that in your age did ne'er view better challenge not fortune for your thriftless debtor sir we have seen far better days than these i was the patron of those days and know those were but painted days only for show then grieve not you to fall with him that gave them generosi servis gloriosum mori dear go thou art my learned secretary you master catesby steward of my house the rest like you have had fair time to grow in sunshine of my fortunes but i must tell ye corruption is fled hence with each man's office bribes that make open traffic twixt the soul and netherland of hell deliver up their guilty homage to the second lords then living thus untainted you are well truth is no pilot for the land of hell enter a servant my lord there are new lighted at the gate the earls of surrey and of shrewbury and they expect you in the inner court entreat their lordships come into the hall exit servant O oh god what news with them why how now wife they are but come to visit their old friend O oh god i fear i fear what shouldst thou fear fond woman justum si fractus illabatur orbis in pavidum ferient ruine here let me live estranged from great men's looks they are like golden flies on leaden hooks enter the earls downs with his mace and attendants good morrow good sir thomas kind salutations good day good madam welcome my good lords what ails your lordships look so melancholy oh i know you live in court and the court diet is only friend to physic oh sir thomas our words are now the king's and our sad looks the interest of your love we are sent to you from our mild sovereign once more to demand if you'll subscribe unto those articles he sent ye the other day be well advised for on mine honour lord grave dr fisher bishop of rochester at the selfsame instant attached with you is sent unto the tower for the like obstinacy his majesty hath only sent you prisoner to your house but if you now refuse for to subscribe a stricter course will follow o oh, dear husband kneeling and weeping dear father see my lords 
this partner and these subjects to my flesh prove rebels to my conscience but my good lords if i refuse must i unto the tower you must my lord here is an officer ready for to arrest you of high treason o oh god o oh god. Oh god be patient good madam ay downs is thou i once did save thy life when else by cruel riotous assault thou hadst been torn in pieces thou art reserved to be my summoner to yon spiritual court give me thy hand good fellow smooth thy face the diet that thou drinkest is spiced with mace and i could ne'er abide it twill not digest twill lie too heavily man on my weak breast be brief my lord for we are limited unto an hour unto an hour tis well the bell soon shall toll my nail dear loving husband if you respect not me yet think upon your daughters kneeling wife stand up i have bethought me and i'll now satisfy the king's good pleasure pointing to himself oh happy alteration come then subscribe my lord i am right glad of this your fair conversion oh pardon me i will subscribe to go unto the tower with all submissive willingness and thereto add my bones to strengthen the foundation of julius caesar's palace now my lord i'll satisfy the king even with my blood now will i wrong your patience friend do thine office sir thomas more lord chancellor of england i arrest you in the king's name of high treason gramercy's friend to a great prison to discharge the strife commenced twixt conscience and my frailer life more now must march chelsea adieu adieu <laughs> strange farewell thou shalt ne'er more see more true for i shall ne'er see thee more servants uh, farewell <sighs> wife mar not thine indifferent face be wise moore's widow's husband he must make thee rise oh, daughters what's here what's here mine eye had almost parted with a tear and dear son possess my virtue that i ne'er gave Grave more thus lightly walks to a quick grave. Curae levus locuntur, mingentus stupent. You that way in, mind you my course in prayer, by water I to prison, to heaven through air. Exeunt. End of Act Four. of Sir Thomas More by Anthony Munday. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Five. Scene One. The Tower Gate. Enter the warders of the tower with halberds. Oh, make a guard there. Master Lieutenant gives a straight command the people be avoided from the bridge from whence is he committed who can tell from durham house i hear the guard were waiting there an hour ago if he stay long he'll not get near the wharf there's such a crowd of boats upon the thames well be it spoken without offence to any a wiser or more virtuous gentleman was never bred in england i think the poor will bury him in tears i never heard a man since i was born so generally bewailed of every one Enter a poor woman. What means this woman? Where doest thou purse? This woman will be trod to death anoon. What makest thou here? To speak with that good man, Sir Thomas More. To speak with him? He is not Lord Chancellor. The more is the pity, sir, if it please the God. Therefore, if thou hast a petition to deliver, thou mayest keep it now for anything I know. I am a poor woman and have had god knows a suit this two year in the chancery 
and he had all the evidence I have, which should I lose? I am utterly undone. Faith, and I fear thou'lt hardly come by em now. I am sorry for thee, even with all my heart. Enter the lords, with Sir Thomas More and attendants, and enter lieutenant and gentleman porter. Woman, stand back. You must avoid this place. The lords must pass this way into the tower. I thank your lordships for your pains thus far to my strong house. Now, good Sir Thomas More, for Christ's dear sake, deliver me my writings back again that do concern my title. What? My old client, are thou got hither too? Uh, poor silly wretch, I must confess indeed I had such writings as concern thee near, but the king has taken over the matter into his own hand. He has all I had. Then, woman, sue him. I cannot help thee. Thou must bear with me. Ah, gentle heart, my soul for thee is sad. Farewell, the best friend that the poor ear had. Exit, woman. Before you enter through the tower gate, the uppermost garment, sir, belongs to me. Sir, you shall have it. There it is. He gives him his cap. The uppermost on your back, sir, you mistake me. Sir, now I understand you very well. But that you name my back, sure else my cap had been the uppermost. Farewell, kind lord. God send us merry meeting. Amen, my lord. Farewell, dear friend. I hope your safe return. My lord and my dear fellow in the muses, farewell. Farewell, most noble poet. Adieu, most honored lords. Exeunt lords. Fair prison, welcome. Yet methinks for thy fair building tis too foul a name. Many a guilty soul and many an innocent have breathed their farewell to thy hollow rooms. I oft have entered into thee this way. Yet I thank God ne'er with a clear conscience than at this hour. It is my comfort yet how hard sore my lodging prove, the cry of the poor suitor, fatherless orphan or distressed widow, shall not disturb me in my quiet sleep. Oh, on then, a God's name, to our close abode. God is as strong here as he is abroad. Exeunt. Scene two. Moore's house. Enter butler, porter, and horsekeeper several ways. Robin Brewer, how now, man? What cheer? What cheer? Faith, Ned Butler, sick of thy disease. And these our other fellows here, Raphael Horsekeeper and Giles Porter. Sad. Sad. They say my lord goes to his trial to-day. To it, man. Why, he is now at it. God send him well to speed. Amen. Even as I wish to mine own soul, so speed it with mine honourable lord and master, Sir Thomas More. I cannot tell I have nothing to do with matters above my capacity, but, as God judge me, if I might speak my mind, I think there lives not a more harmless gentleman in the universal world. Nor a wiser, nor a merrier, nor an honester. Go to, I'll put that in upon mine own knowledge. Nay. And ye bade him his due of his housekeeping, hang ye all. Ye have many Lord Chancellors comes in debt at the year's end, and for very housekeeping. Well, he was too good a lord for us, and therefore I fear God himself will take him. But I'll be hanged if ever I have such another service. Soft man, we are not discharged yet. My lord may come home again, and all will be well. I much mistrust it. When they go to reigning once, there's ever foul weather for a great while after. But soft, here comes Master Goff and Master Catesby. Now we shall hear more. Enter Go and Gadsby with a paper. Before God, they're very sad. I doubt my lord is condemned. God bless his soul! And a fig, then, for all worldly condemnation. Well said, Giles Porter, I commend thee for it. "'Twas spoken like a well-affected servant of him that was a kind lord to us all. "'Which now no more he shall be for dear fellows. "'Now we are masterless, though he may live so long as pleased the king, "'but law hath made him a dead man to the world, and given the axe his head. 
but his sweet soul to live among the saints let us entreat ye to go call together the rest of your sad fellows by the rule yard just seven score and tell them what we hear a virtuous honourable lord hath done even for the meanest follower that he had this writing found my lady in his study this instant morning wherein is set down each servant's name according to his place and office in the house on every man he frankly hath bestowed twenty nobles the best and worst together all alike which master catesby here forth will pay ye take it as it is meant a kind remembrance of a far kinder lord with whose sad fall he gives up house and farewell to us all thus the fair spreading oak falls not alone but all the neighbour plants and under trees are crushed down with his weight no more of this come and receive your due and after go fellow like hence co-partners of one woe exeunt scene three the tower enter sir thomas moore the lieutenant and a servant attending as in his chamber in the tower uh, master lieutenant is the warrant to come if it be so a god's name let us know it my lord it is tis welcome sir to me with all my heart his blessed will be done your wisdom sir hath been so well approved and your fair patience and imprisonment hath ever shown such constancy of mine in christian resolution in all troubles as warrant us you are not unprepared uh, no master lieutenant i thank my god i have peace of conscience though the world and i are at a little odds but will be even now i hope ere long when is uh, the execution of your warrant tomorrow morning so sir i thank ye i have not lived so ill i fear to die master lieutenant i have had a sore fit of the stone to-night but the king hath sent me such a rare receipt i, I thank him as i shall not need to fear it much in life and death still marry sir thomas more uh, sir a fellow uh, reach me the urinal he gives it him ha <laughs> ha let me see uh, there's gravel in the water and yet i see no grave danger in that the man were likely to live long enough so please the king here fellow take it shall i go with it to the doctor sir no save thy labour we'll cosen him a fee thou shalt see me take a dram to-morrow morning shall cure the stone i warrant doubt it not master lieutenant what news of my lord of rochester yesterday morning he was put to death ah uh, the peace of soul sleep with him he was a learned and reverend prelate and a rich man i believe if he were rich what is sir thomas more that all this while hath been lord chancellor say ye so master lieutenant what do ye think a man that with my time had held my place might purchase perhaps my lord two thousand pounds a year master lieutenant i protest to you i never had the means in all my life to purchase one poor hundred pound a year i think i am the poorest chancellor that ever was in england though i could wish for credit of the place uh, that my estate were better it's very strange it will be found as true i think sir that with most part of my coin i have purchased a strange commodities as ever you heard tell of in your life commodities my lord might i without offence inquire of them crouches master lieutenant and bear cloaks for halting soldiers and poor needy scholars have had my gettings in the chancery to think but what a cheat the crown shall have by my attainder i prithee if thou beest a gentleman get but a copy of my inventory that part of poet that was given me made me very unthrift for this is the disease attends us all poets were never thrifty never shall enter lady moore morning daughters master roper oh noble moore my lord your wife your son-in-law and daughters ah oh, son roper welcome welcome wife and girls why do you weep because i live at ease 
but do you not see when i was chancellor i was so clogged with suitors every hour i could not sleep dine nor sup in quiet here's none of this here i can sit and talk with my honest keeper half a day together laugh and be merry why then should you weep these tears my lord for this your long restraint hope had dried up with comfort that we yet although imprisoned might have had your life to live in prison what a life were that the king i thank him loves me more than so to-morrow i shall be at liberty to go even whether i can after i have dispatched my business ah husband husband yet submit yourself have care of your poor wife and children wife uh, so i have and i do leave you all to his protection hath the power to keep you safer than i can the father of the widow and the orphans the world my lord hath ever held you wise and shall be no the state unto your wisdom to yield to the opinion of the state i have deceived myself i must acknowledge and as you say son roper to confess the same i will be no disparagement at all his highness shall be certified thereof immediately offering to depart nay hear me wife first let me tell ye how i thought to have had a barber for my beard now i remember that were labor lost the headsman now shall cut off head and all father his majesty upon your meek submission will yet they say receive you to his grace in as great credit as you were before has appointed me to do a little business if that were past my girl then thou should see what i would say to him about the matter but i shall be so busy until then i shall not tend to it ah my dear father dear lord and husband be comforted good wife to live and love my children for with thee leave i all my care of them son roper for my sake that have loved thee well and for her virtue's sake cherish my child girl be not proud but of thy husband's love ever retain thy virtuous modesty that modesty is such a comely garment as it is never out of fashion sits as fair upon the meaner woman as the empress no stuff that gold can buy is half so rich nor ornament that so becomes a woman live all and love together and thereby you give your father a rich obsequy your blessing dear, dear father i must be gone god bless you to talk with god who now doth call i my dear husband sweet wife good night good night god send us all his everlasting light i think before this hour more heavy hearts ne'er are parted in the tower. Exeunt. Scene four, Tower Hill. Enter the sheriffs of London and their officers at one door, the warders with their halberts at another. Officers, what time of day is it? Almost eight o'clock. We must make haste then, lest we stay too long. Good morrow, Master Shreves of London. Master Lieutenant wills you repair to the limits of the tower, there to receive your prisoner. Go back and tell his worship we are ready. Go bid the officers make clear the way. There may be passage for the prisoner. Enter Lieutenant and his guard with more. Yet God be thanked. Here's a fair day toward to take our journey in. Master Lieutenant, it were fair walking on the tower leads. And so it might have liked, my sovereign lord. I would to God you might have walked there still. He weeps. Sir, we are walking to a better place. Oh, sir, your kind and loving tears are like sweet odors to embalm your friend. Thank you, good lady. Since I was your guest, she has made me a very wanton, in good sooth. Oh, I had hoped we should not have yet parted. But I must leave ye for a little while. Within an hour or two ye may look for me. But there will be so many come to see me that I shall be so proud I will not speak. 
and sure my memory is grown so ill i fear i shall forget my head behind me god and his blessed angels be about ye here master shreves receive your prisoner good morrow master shreves of london to ye both i thank ye that ye will vouchsafe to meet me i see by this you have not quite forgot that i was in times past as you are now a sheriff of london so then you know our duty doth require it i know it well sir else i would have been glad you might have saved a labor at this time ah uh, mr sheriff you and i have been of old acquaintance you were a patient auditor of mine when i read the divinity lecture at uh, st lawrence's sir thomas more i have heard you oft as many other did to our great comfort pray god you may so now with all my heart and now as i call to mind when i studied the law in lincoln's inn i was of counsel with ye in a cause i was about to say so good sir thomas oh uh, is this the place i promise ye it is a goodly scaffold in sooth i am come about a headless errand <laughs> for i have not much to say now i am here well let's ascend a god's name and troth methinks your stair is somewhat weak i i pray thee honest friend lend me thy hand to help me up as for my coming down let me alone i'll look to that myself <laughs> as he is going up the stairs enters the earls of surrey and shrewsbury my lords of surrey and shrewsbury give me your hands yet before we ye see though it pleaseth the king to raise me thus high yet i am not proud for the higher i mount the better i can see my friends about me i am now on a far voyage and this strange wooden horse must bear me thither yet i perceive by your looks you like my bargain so ill that there's not one of ye dare enter with me truly here's a sweet gallery walking i like the air of it better than my garden at chelsea by your patience good people that have pressed thus into my bedchamber if you'll not trouble me i'll take a sound sleep here my lord were good you'd publish to the world your great offence unto his majesty my lord i'll bequeath this legacy to the hangman gives him his gown and do it instantly i confess his majesty hath been ever good to me and my offence to his highness makes me of a state pleader a stage player though i am old and have a bad voice to act this last scene of my tragedy I'll send him, for my trespass, a reverend head is somewhat bald, for it is not requisite any head should stand covered to so high majesty. If that content him not, because I think my body will then do me small pleasure, let him bury it and take it. My lord, my lord, hold conference with your soul. You see, my lord, the time of life is short i see it my good lord i dispatched that business the last night i come hither only to be let blood my doctor here tells me it is good for the headache i beseech thee my lord forgive me forgive thee honest fellow why for your death my lord oh my death I had rather it were in thy power to forgive me, for thou hast the sharpest action against me. The law, my honest friend, lies in thy hands now. Here's thy fee, his purse, and my good fellow, let my suit be dispatched presently, for tis all one pain to die a lingering death and to live in the continual mill of a lawsuit but i can tell thee my neck is so short that if thou shouldst behead an hundred noblemen like myself thou shouldst ne'er get credit by it therefore look ye sir 
do it handsomely, or of my word thou shalt never deal with me hereafter. I'll take an order for that, my lord. One thing more. Take heed thou cuts not off my beard. Oh, I, I forgot. Execution passed upon that last night, and the body of it lies buried in the tower. Stay, is not possible to take escape from all this strong guard? It is. There is a thing within me that will raise and elevate my better part above sight of these same weaker eyes. And, Master Shreves, for all this troop of steel that tends my death, I shall break from you and fly up to heaven. Let's seek the means for this. My lord, I pray you, put off your doublet. Speak not so coldly to me. I am hoarse already. I would be loath, good fellow, to take more. Uh, point me to the block. I ne'er was here before. To the east side, my lord. And then to the east we go to sigh, that o'er to sleep and rest here more forsakes all mirth, good reason why. The fool of flesh must with her frail life die. No I salute my trunk with a sad tear. Our birth to heaven should be thus, void of fear. Exit with hangman, etc. A very learned, worthy gentleman seals error with his blood. Come, we'll to court, that sadly hence to perfect unknown fates, whilst he tends pro-grace to the state of states. Fini. End of Act 5 End of Sir Thomas More by Anthony Munday